In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The people will call you a magician, John. So long as they grasp your law, Isaac. These seven colors should please them. It is the understanding that the colors cannot be separated any further. That is what they must grasp. Light. Every Mason knows how important the symbolism of light has always been in his ritual. Throughout his long journey and with divine guidance, a Freemason is offered ancient advice to take him on his path from darkness to light. In many ways, Freemasons have spent the last 300 years spreading their light. And the light of Freemasonry's values of tolerance, self-improvement, and service to others. In 1719, John Theophilus de Zagulier had become the third Grand Master of the premier Grand Lodge since Anthony Sayer first took the chair at the Goose and Gridiron two years earlier. Having been elected to the Royal Society in 1714 as experimental assistant to Sir Isaac Newton, Desaguliers was a natural philosopher, clergyman, and engineer. He popularized Newtonian theories and their practical applications in lectures, many of which were given in large meetings. Desaguliers was a visionary and a born showman with a talent for scientific demonstrations. But some of his demonstrations could be decidedly unusual. No. Now, hold still, Payne. What in the name of God? No, pull! Hmm? Pull, man, pull! Mm. Oh. A horse that draws a stone tied to a rope. Oh. I, Desagulier, am not a horse. I wonder whether a real horse might be better suited. Imagine the roar of its breath as it drags the unyielding stone. Do you have a horse? Yeah, about my person, no. We must make do with what we have. Can we talk of the matter in hand? Giddy up, old boy! Oh. Come on, put your back into it. Oh. Oh. The horse will be equally drawn back to the stone. Simple mechanics. Force, leverage. Fascinating. London in 1719 is a city of splendor and squalor and over half a million souls. It has just overtaken Paris to become the largest city in Europe and is considered to represent the best that the world has to offer. Around a tenth of the population are, like Desaguliers, French Huguenots, who have sought sanctuary in Protestant England, fleeing years of persecution in Catholic France. A Catholic France that had given status and succor to James Francis Edward Stuart, the son of James II and the pretender to the British throne. England may have bloodied the nose of the Jacobite rising, but that did not end the influence of the pretender to the crown. A crown worn since 1714 by George I, placed on the throne via the Act of Succession, a Protestant preferred by Parliament, and a pragmatic and rational choice for the politically dominant Whigs, bent on cementing constitutional government, not absolutism. Rational, maybe, but not wholly popular. Even in this enlightened city, his accession met with protests and riots. The threat of disorder, of rebellion, of a retreat to the past was real and present. It is in this context that the light of Freemasonry offers a beacon of hope and sanctuary, not just for the present, but for the future too. Freemasonry is the embodiment of new and exciting enlightenment ideas that are building traction across Britain and Europe. Freemasons 
are seeking new insight to shape purpose, growing an understanding of the intricate workings of this world, and offering a constant discipline and devotion in pursuit of one shared goal, to make it good. Of course, Freemasonry was not new. Medieval stonemasons had met in lodges where they drew moral lessons from the tools of their craft. Their legends recall that the art of masonry was first taught by Euclid, and that in England, a hundred years before the time of William the Conqueror, a great assembly of masons met at York under Prince Edwin, where they drew up a historic code for the guidance of the craft. This code, the ancient charges, had remained largely unchanged for centuries, but they were of a different time. They represented an old world, where the established Catholic Church was all-powerful, and the right of a divinely appointed monarch to rule with absolute power was unquestioned. With the formation of the Premier Grand Lodge in 1717, the Founding Fathers of Freemasonry saw and embraced an incredible opportunity, not just to rewrite the charges, but to create a traditional history of the craft, as well as to set out the parameters, regulations, by which the order would be governed. Des Aguliers, George Payne, and the Reverend James Anderson, all senior members of the Horn Tavern Lodge, met in the upstairs room at the Goose and Gridiron Public House to discuss what these new constitutions might contain. Desaguliers' motivation was more personal than that of either Payne or Anderson. His family had suffered persecution in their native France and had been forced into exile. Our principle here, that of tolerance, touches me materially. We all agree with the sentiment of religious toleration. We know you have suffered, but toleration is hard to enshrine in the charges, and we must respect tradition. We must find a way. So you do miss France, then? I miss the cheese. And do you miss... What is that hideous thing you Scots call a delicacy? I guess. Uh, not great, no. I rather like it here in London. Not that you were driven out by force, were you, Anderson? Or your financial choices. The South Sea Company was promised to everyone as something life-changing. Was. For those unfortunate souls being sold to fund it. I believe the propaganda. I should have done my due diligence before parting with money and morals. Pray God will forgive my stupidity. Truth. You were fooled, Anderson. Mm. By the so-called ruling classes. Wisdom is not bred. It is learnt. Education. Merit. Ignorance. Intolerance. Greed. All enemies of mankind. We are surrounded by close-minded, witless fools! Improving personal behaviour. We see proof that with upright intentions, square conduct and level steps, we can all improve. One day, integrity will be prized higher than inherited privileges. Meritocracy. Mm. Have you met our politician? Ah, yes. Perhaps a little idealistic. <laughs> Some will always rather fill their bellies with self-importance than feed those less fortunate. But I, for one, would rather share my good fortune. Charity. Hmm. If you hadn't gifted your fortune to lying rogues. Well, I consider myself fortunate. We have each other. That we do, old boys, that we do. Ah, brotherly love. Right, right, I think we have our principles. Uh, meritocracy, mm. high standards of personal behavior, charity and education. Mm. And... Civic responsibility. There speaks the magistrate. But we must expressly declare religious tolerance, not mere courtesy. Courtesy is vital. It can lead to religious toleration, not just in the educated, throughout society. A peculiar system of morality, brotherly love. I said that. Imagine three great pillars of power shimmering in the light. An all-seeing eye unblinking at its faith and knowledge. We have a tight paper budget, Anderson. The three pillars and the eye. Strong. Thank you. Gentlemen, we are rewriting the charges, not penning a theatrical drama. 
Not a theatrical drama, perhaps, but the document that these three were creating could certainly have a dramatic impact. They worked around the clock to get it right. The importance of what they were doing kept all three focused, energized, and resolutely alert. As the work continued and the new constitutions began to take shape, it became clear that each had different skills that they could bring to the project. Anderson, hmm? you are the expert on the Old Testament. You will write our traditional history. I have so many wonderful images, not just the pillars. I see a checkered floor. Jacob's ladder, the sun and moon. Uh, we can always edit. Uh, the religious toleration clause can be added later, if respecting tradition. Take this down. Though in ancient times, masons were charged in every country to be of the religion of that country or nation. Ancient times? Yes. Mm. Respecting traditions and earlier times. But tis now thought more necessary. <laughs> no, not necessary. Expedient. Agreed. Expedient only to oblige them to that religion in which we all agree. Mm. Uh, leaving their particular opinions to themselves. That is, to be good men and true. Or men of honor and honesty. Mm. By whatever denominations or persuasions, they may be distinguished. <laughs> yeah. well, so now, I am left with the regulations. <laughs> Well, no one else has such a flair for subscriptions and due. <laughs> Brotherly love, relief, and truth. The three grand principles on which the order is founded. Brotherly love, a welcome to all people under heaven. Relief, a dedication to charitable work and the relief of distress or suffering more generally and truth, a daily search for moral advancement, was to form the core of their work as our three brethren worked tirelessly to compile the new constitutions. This was to be a truly radical document and would also focus on meritocracy and aspiration at a time when birth and wealth normally determine success. But perhaps most radical of all would be the key principle of religious tolerance. This was little short of revolutionary in a world that was characterized by religious conflict. The battle between Catholic and Protestant had led to the death of hundreds of thousands in Europe. Persecution because of religious belief was not only endemic, but was accepted as commonplace. Freemasonry would change all of that, offering a beacon of hope to the oppressed. If we speak of politics or religion, it is to find that which unites rather than divides us. The Grand Lodge is the United Lodge. Its grandeur lies not in its vanities, but in its vision. The new charges that Desaguliers was to write the principles to which all Freemasons were expected to adhere represented a sweeping change that was years ahead of its time, replacing the ancient Trinitarian Christian belief that had always been at the heart of Freemasonry, with an obligation to that religion in which all men agree. Some may call it faith, but if it is, it is faith in the tools and the craft we have to wield. Faith in each other, faith 
in our reason and rational self-government. In the infinite capacity of man, yes, perhaps to dream in God's image, but to make it manifest on earth. It is belief. It is science. It is enlightenment. George Payne, ever the magistrate, who served reason and philosophy through his labor and effort, would compile general regulations detailing the administration of Grand Lodge and all the Masonic lodges under its umbrella. And James Anderson, a visionary writer, would create and set down a comprehensive traditional history of the craft. He looked to the future by inventing the past. For a society in which tradition was of utmost importance, this was vital, to place the craft in a historical context and give the new Grand Lodge legitimacy. Masonic songs and music would also be included. Music was the kernel of social life at all levels. It reinforced camaraderie and tradition and lodge meetings would resonate with the sound of communal singing. These were men who sought ways to bring together, to connect. The brethren in the lodges of this city and later the world coming together in common purpose to unite as the Grand Lodge. We three have forged this as none could alone. It is indeed. A miracle. Cementing our new constitution while preserving the principles of the past, but taking out forever all undue deference to a divinely appointed monarch and a Trinitarian religion. I wonder whether I should add a little more description to... No. What about adding more lines to the initiation ceremony? Do we have enough oaths? We don't wish to alienate those without time or mind to memorize verbose rituals. Although, it might weed out those that lack commitment. I've been thinking. Genius does not rest. We need a figurehead. Someone of noble status that can vouch for our legitimacy, our craft. Someone who can encourage others to join us and build our brotherhood. Are you suggesting that a man of God a man of science and a magistrate of the highest standing lack legitimacy. No, no, not at all. But for the people. We need a man who others, whatever their background, whatever their position, will respect. A man who can, through his skill as an orator and his standing within society, become a magnet. A man who will defend our craft from the most vehement of doubters. A man liked and admired by all. You? <laughs> How kind of you to think that I'm worthy. I will endeavor to- I know just the man. John, Duke of Montague, was an inspired choice. A keen Freemason, in 1721, the Duke became the first nobleman to hold the office of Grand Master and his installation marked a turning point in Freemasonry. Of course, the order itself had equality at its very heart. It sought to measure the merit of a man on its own terms by the bonds of fellowship formed within the lodge, not by birthright or lineage. To be master within the lodge conferred no greatness in the outside world. But why the society had not yet embraced this radical concept? And for the new Grand Lodge to flourish, it needed the social credibility that came with the fairy dust of privilege and rank. Montague's leadership demonstrated that Freemasonry was socially attractive and intellectually and politically acceptable, and that it could be fun. It was a testament to his prestige and reputation that a significant number of other aristocrats and learned scholars followed his example. Many hundreds and then thousands followed. 
Before 1721, the annual Masonic Grand Feast had taken place in taverns. But with Montague at the head of the order, the installation and Grand Feast was moved from the Goose and Gridiron to Stationers Hall to accommodate the several hundred who wished to attend. Montague's installation marked a turning point in Freemasonry's public profile and underpinned its ability to attract a broad, aspirational membership. It cemented Grand Lodge's authority over the growing number of Masonic Lodges in London and provincial England as the Order took its first steps toward a world where even the mighty might recognize the value of the craft the integrity of its aspirations and the rational virtue of esteeming reason rather than rank. Well, I am flattered, gentlemen, truly I am. Do you seem to think that little old me has the ability to be a, what did you call it again? A publicist. Hmm. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, you wish me to use my social standing to promote the craft and uh, indoctrinate others. And I'm not sure indoctrinate is the right word. Perhaps encourage. Good point. Yes, we don't want to be seen as men who force their opinions on others. We embrace forward-thinking motives in our new constitutions. Did you know, Your Grace, that I am to be credited with the creation of our new constitution? My congratulations, Anderson. Mm. Such great effort must be celebrated. Celebrated is a fine way to put it, Your Grace. We are indeed celebrating our forefathers' immense effort to grow a fair and equal society. One where charity, meritocracy, science, faith, will eventually find its rightful place and stand a full head above birth-allocated privilege. We share the same principles, gentlemen. Please do not offer me any more deference than you would yourselves or any of our other brothers. With this in mind, I do wonder whether I am the ideal candidate. The last thing I would wish is to create yet more division. Not at all. You will be the buffer between classes, the glue that bonds the rich to the poor, the cement between the stones, the star that draws all men to its light, the physician that heals the wounds of the afflicted. Is he always like this? Yes. Let's be honest. We're a bit short on nobility. Our ideals must offer succor to both rich and poor, to the titled and layperson. Aha. So, I am to use my status and renown uh, to uh, indoctrinate, encourage our brothers and potential brothers to support our Grand Lodge, its guiding principles, brotherly love, and all the cognac that goes with both. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Wait. Listen to this. I shall be a... Celebrate. A Celebrate tea. I fear I should warn you uh, of the inevitable reprisals from religious authorities. I have received some recently, and the only advice I can give is not to read them. And there are some who will think of you as a nonconformist, <laughs> and therefore a threat to society. Monarchs themselves will swap the scepter for the trowel. That's the spirit. Yes, it's a good phrase, that. Uh, one last question. What is a trowel? It's like a spade, only smaller. Mm. Oh, for digging? Yes, Your Grace. I won't be expected to do manual work. I think those days are gone. We could arrange for you to be seen using a chisel, mm. perhaps? Uh, I think a common gavel might be safer. I should learn to use all the tools. In fact, I insist upon it. Gentlemen, I am honored, humbled that you believe in me. I am not afraid of hard work. I shall strive to achieve everything you ask for our brothers, 
for our forefathers, I shall take an oath, a solemn obligation to be the best celebrity that Freemasonry could wish for. Oh, that's another oath for the list. We've already gone to print, Anderson. Dedicated to Montague, the constitutions were published exactly 300 years ago, in 1723. With this radical document at its core, Freemasonry offered something entirely new, which beautifully encapsulated the essence and spirit of the age. It provided a universe of meaning, exalting the Mason to the pursuit of wisdom, strength, fairness, and sensitivity to the needs of others, urging him to be useful to mankind and to perform his allotted task while it is yet day. By its symbolic lessons, it provided a clear path of moral enlightenment to honor the great architect, mankind, and yourself. This allure of the craft led to rapid growth in its popularity and the number of lodges within the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of England rose vertiginously from the founding four in 1717 to more than 60 in 1725 and over 100 by 1730. It fast became the most prominent of Britain's many fraternal organizations, capturing the imagination of men from all walks of life and from all parts of the country. It is through the prism of this document that Masonic light has been refracted and spread to the seven continents of the world. With its strong bonds of camaraderie, Freemasonry developed a large provincial network and grew internationally, naturally traveling the long, dusty roads of Great Britain's influence, west to the United States and Canada, south to Africa, and east to India and the Far East, tracking trade routes, military expansion, migration, and aristocratic connections from grand tours of Europe. Across the globe, English-speaking lodges became a feature of 18th and 19th century life. Many larger cities had their own lodges, where the nationalities mixed freely. The British Army had traveling lodges that moved with regiments. Many people discovered Freemasonry far from Britain. Nobel Prize winning author brother Rudyard Kipling, finding himself in Lahore as a young newspaper man, was made a Freemason in the Lodge of Hope and Perseverance, 782 English Constitution. Here he met with Freemasons who were Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, members of the Araya and Brahmu Samaj, and a Jewish tiler who was a priest and butcher to his little community in the city. As the globe embraced Freemasonry, its light came to be revealed, not just to the initiate, but to the world.